Well, thanks very much. It's good to be here. And it's also good to, to agree very much with, um, with Ollie that CO2 is a great narrowing down of the issues that we face. And that we have many interactive problems. And as human beings, we're very capable of seeing across a very wide spectrum of issues and linking things up together that we don't necessarily currently think should be, should be linked. So that um, I, I remember talking to somebody about how scientists should be accompanied by, uh, by people from other disciplines working interactively with them. I think that there's, there's a very keen way in which we also ought to take on some of the perspectives of, say, indigenous people who have not been consulted about geoengineering. I worked at the, uh, the um, Biological Diversity Convention and, and asked for some of their people to be consulted on this. I think that there are insights from other cultures, other human cultures, that might be very helpful to us, other points of view. So I do think we need to broaden this discussion greatly and not keep it in this terrible sort of um, threatening, you can't really do anything about it. Um, and you better leave it to us to do something about it. And so you better just carry, I mean, better just carry on or just pretend that nothing is happening. I think we could have a much richer and wider discussion, much more inclusive discussion than that. Um, and certainly, we know much more about the risks of geoengineering, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to see now. And um, so we know that climate is a big threat and we know that geoengineering is also carrying uh, a major threat. And one of the issues that I would like to mention is that I think that geoengineering does add on to the, to the issues and the difficulties because we are dealing with dynamic systems here. We're dealing with a dynamic climate system. We know how dynamic it is, that it interacts with, bi with uh, biological diversity. It also interacts with, with solar cycles. And so many other different kinds of cycle as well. We have to realize that we really don't understand very much. Our models are extraordinarily inadequate and clumsy and linear still. And so we need to be looking much more widely again and understanding something about the kind of uncertainties that we face here. And we don't want to compound those uncertainties unnecessarily. I think also we need a different kind of research um, we need much more research into, into, the, into systems, into Earth systems, and if we're going to, if we're going to do anything about um, our situation. But we do have a major problem with moral hazard. I think there are a number of aspects to this. I think people don't feel included. I've been to some of the climate convention discussions and I've seen governments taking positions. But then what do people have? Uh, in, in the way of influence over this position taking and this blame game that goes on all the time. And it diverts, it obviously, um, we, we run the risk of having our attention diverted from what's really important by talking about pricing the environment, trying to find an economic answer, and um, looking at possible remedies like, like uh, BECS, which was mentioned by energy, carbon capture and storage, which one person said is not geoengineering, but it's certainly being proposed as a, as, as a way of addressing some of these issues, or solar radiation management. So we do have a major issue around moral hazard. And one of the things that used to strike me at the climate talks was why didn't the developed countries have more to say about making commitments to change, to real change. I think real change would be possible if we allowed ourselves to, to, to think about it, but it seems as though our economics and our way of looking at the world makes it very difficult for us to even contemplate change. But perhaps it's not so difficult as, as, as we think it is, and maybe we should, we should think in those terms, we should try and renew our thought and our discourse rather than getting stuck in, this, in, in, in certain ways of thinking about it. One of the things that I feel very worried about is technology. Um, our faith in technology is really touching. Um, whether it's our mobile phones or whatever else it might be. And there is a real danger that we turn, want to turn to technology as a way of addressing politically difficult and complex issues. And I really do think that this is a very visible problem for us. And um, there's a pattern to it. So we are promised solutions. We're drawn down a particular road of discourse, of examination, of, of, of scientific research and we don't look at other areas of, of work. And I think we've seen this pattern repeated many times. 
I was very interested to hear mention of the nitrogen fertilizer issue, which is a very key matter. And there are a number of causes, um, a number of issues around where, where all this, how all this came about. But I must say that I would say that our dependency on, um, our population's dependency on nitrogen fertilizers is something that we have created through the fertilizers. And so we have to think about that and not so much say the other way around, that now we have a very large population, so we have to continue to use nitrogen fertilizers. There may be other ways. There are other ways, I think. But we're told that the situation is now so desperate that we have to act, and this is another way of, of turning the, the thumb screws on us all. And um, this, this is, I think it's very difficult for people to listen to the sort of desperateness of, of, of the situation. Um, too much without having a sense that they could become involved and they could, they could make a contribution to, to changes. So we know that there's too much that's uncertain. I think that's definitely what I feel. There's too much that's uncertain to risk um, most of these so-called solutions. And what about the millions of people who are not included in this debate? People from South America, people from Africa, people from Asia. They feel that the countries that impose the problem on them although that's increasingly shifting, I know, and now proposing a solution from the same mindset as before. And I think we should learn from that. I think we should try to find solutions from other, other sorts of mindset. And um, obviously geoengineering is quite likely to increase social injustice. And, and um, this is something that hasn't been mentioned so far, but social turbulence, injustice, and a sense of, of rage at having certain things done to you. For example, if the monsoon was to fail, if we were to save the Arctic sea ice, if we were, you know, if this was how it was to work, and uh, the monsoon was to fail, just imagine what the people there would feel, how they, what they would do, and how much, how much division this would sow. So the social aspects of this are hugely important. And I can't help thinking that the impacts of climate change as a social problem might be less than the impacts of people trying to do geoengineering. And I'm not even going to try and address the fact that people might do it unilaterally. The point is that I think that we, there are things that we could do that would address a diversity of critical issues. And we have to forget the fact, perhaps, that it feels as though it's impossible that we could do things. We could change our agriculture. There are many things that we could do for our ecosystems to, to uh, restore them, not using carbon dioxide removal specifically, but doing reforestation of native species and, and really looking at, at local projects for local areas. This is hugely difficult perhaps to, to organise, but we have to find societal ways of doing that, not to be oppressed by a problem and a system which we're going to have to change. We are going to have to radically change it in, in order to carry this out. So that's the challenge. Thank you. Is, uh, it's, it's actually it's important because it's one of many factors which define the difficulty of supporting the Earth's population. So, in a sense, it is, there is a panic, um, and you say we, we shouldn't panic. We should we should change to a more sustainable way of life. But that many people would say there simply isn't time. That the world population has increased so much with with industrialised agriculture that we have to go on with industrialised agriculture, otherwise we'll have massive starvation. And this is dangerous because nit nitrogen fertilisers are a case. But another case that that was pointed out to me recently was phosphorus. That fertilisers um, have to be uh, also made from from phosphorus, and phosphorus is running out as a resource in the world. It probably run out. Before, because nitrogen can be synthesised, but phosphorus can't. So uh, the, there's a phosphorus crisis, which was pointed out by Paul Crutz. And uh, so, we, how do we? Uh, it, it, it boils down in the end, I think, still to to the, 
that we should be really worried about immediate effects that threaten our existing population, and which is why we need to, to think about these rather unpleasant things like geoengineering. Uh, well, there are figures that say that we're already producing um, 4,000 calories per head of population, which is more than people need. We waste extraordinary amounts of food. We eat, we feed far too much of that food to animals. 30% of our arable land goes to producing animal feed. There are changes we could make. We have to ask ourselves, is it inevitable that we must continue with, with industrial agriculture because that's what we've been doing? Or can we try to consciously make a change? What a huge demand that is. But if we continue with industrial agriculture, I can't help feeling that we'll get ourselves further into the same hole. So we, we have to make a choice there. I, I, I can feel myself wanting to go down, 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 down the road of industrial agriculture. But I, I wanted to come back to something else. I, I can entirely applaud your aims, but do you not feel that the lack of political traction you have for these things makes collective action really quite hard? Because it remains the case that there's been a strong green movement in the world for now about 40 years. And in, ter and in terms of some policies, it's been extraordinarily successful. But in terms of reducing the overall energy intensity of consumption in Western, civil Western countries, it's um, not done a great deal, and um, most of the um, improvements in living standards in developing countries have come about through energy intensification, which is hard to, man to manage. And so it seems to me that people are relentlessly choosing not to be as you wish them to be. And isn't that something of a problem for your, for your program? I agree it is a, it is a problem. And that's why I say, being at the climate convention discussions back in 2008 to 9, I was thinking, what would happen if, if different commitments were made? Um, I, I totally take your point. You can either say, well, we have to go down this road because people are not going to change and nothing is really good to alter, so we have to take this preventive action. But in a sense, we could say that we have an extraordinary and rather terrifying opportunity to really try and make a change and I don't know how we can do, I mean collective action is very difficult if you ask an indigenous community in Colombia how long it takes them to make a decision that includes everybody, well it takes a while but we seem to have some, some choices here um, philosophical, actual and, and so forth and maybe this is, we have to think about things that we might think are almost impossible, but maybe they're worth trying. Um, <clears throat> this debate, as most debates are, has been focused very much on people and our survival and how we will cope. But very little has been paid to the actual environment. Um, at, present, or at present, we are having the biggest biodiversity crisis in the history of the world. Um, the extinction rate of species is over a thousand times the natural rate and humanity is causing the biggest natural extinction event in history. This is largely attributed to how fast temperatures are changing. My question is if temperatures are brought down just as fast, it does not bring the globe back to where it was pre-industrial revolution. There is no proof of this. So. It has the potential to devastatingly affect species. Can our morals actually support this? Because at the rate of extinction, they just, they can't. I agree with you that the rate of extinction is incredibly worrying and tragic. I don't know if climate change is, is responsible for most of it. I would have imagined that actually human intervention in all sorts of ways is, is responsible for most of it. And we're destroying species that we haven't even seen. We don't even know that we've seen them yet. We certainly haven't described them. And that is possibly an even greater crisis in many ways because that undermines what we depend upon. Um, we, we depend upon diver, di diversity of species, species that we know, species that we don't know, take 
take the Brazil nut tree and the bee that fertilizes the flowers, whose male has to bathe in an orchid flower in order to attract the female. Now, what complexity is there that we hardly understand? A, a marvelous story, but how many other lines of complexity are there? I, I would totally agree with you, and I think that that's why we have to somehow expand ourselves so as to be able to look beyond our own human horizons. I mean, that's another challenge that we have. And I think that we have to look at what the challenges are and what we, what we kind of need to do, rather than taking a, a slightly mechanistic or economical point of view on it. That's all I can say. Today, <coughs> today the conversation has Sorry. consistently said that no one wants to use uh, geoengineering and the slippery slope argument is being put forward. But let me put forward a scenario to you based upon the, the, what I believe is the case, that the engineering has not yet been done for any of these geoengineering projects. In other words, it probably would take 20 or 30 years to bring the information to the fore where in fact it can be done. So let me try to ask you how you would feel in 30 years time, if you had the tides rise and all of Bangladesh was wiped out and there was absolutely nothing you could do because you haven't done the, pre the preliminary work. This I find a familiar argument and it's, I can see that it could be one that would be going to make me feel very bad if I was to stop, I mean just talking from a personal point of view, stop looking at, at seawater rise in Bangladesh. But the point is, how are we going to agree to do these things and, and in what way? I mean you're treating the people of Bangladesh as though they were, when you say that, it's almost like a sort of objectification, it's, it's hard to... It, Certainly, we, sh we should. Yes, okay, so that, absolutely. And the people in the Maldives at the climate, climate talks always say we're sinking under the water as well. And they laugh at the idea of, of, of the insurance companies who come along because it's ludicrous to suggest that they might be insurable. I agree that we should be looking at how to solve these problems. I'm just worried about us looking through, looking with a particular, through a particular lens at it and that it kind of disempowers people. And that's the question that I'm asking. I'm asking um, because people, individuals and governments can make decisions and decide that this is the right way to go forward and we'll do this. Sorry? You're stopping the research. Stopping the research. I'm not stopping the research on Earth systems and how to, how to look at it. I'm just trying to challenge this idea that there is a sort of mechanical way of, of dealing with this that we, can, that we can guarantee in some way because I'm uncertain that this is the case. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paola. <laughs> I think uh, that the issues are, 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 are complex and multifaceted. I, I'm running a, a, a course this week uh, which actually has a slightly different title. It's called Can We Engineer the Climate? And my students are all sitting over there. Um, and it's, it's a bit scary you, you, when you start from the supposition that, that can you do it? It's a different question to whether we ought to do it or whether we should think about doing it. And I'm, I'm very pleased the speakers tonight have uh, uh, address the issue of whether we should think about uh, engineering the climate. Now I should uh, then close by asking you the question whether we should think about engineering the climate. Uh, how many of you are um, on the fence and undecided? How many of you think uh, that we should think about engineering the climate? And how many of you think we ought not to think about engineering climate? Well, there we go. That's how we've um, managed to uh, uh, move our audience this evening.
And I'd like you, in the warmest possible fashion, to thank our speakers tonight.